You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good evening, all you beautiful people out there. How is everybody doing tonight? Happy Monday, July 10th. Guys, we survived the 4th of July weekend. We survived dealing with family, maybe our good family, maybe the family we don't care about, but we have to spend time with them anyway. The one thing that's really frustrating to me about a 4th of July weekend, honestly, is this kind of like a negative path? Like, I don't know, I feel like this is a negative vibe, but it's you, you usually have your water to yourself. You have your river and, you know, kind of feeds into this topic tonight, creeks or, or small rivers. And you have them to yourself usually like 11 months out of the year. But come 4th of July weekend, good Lord, everyone and their brothers out there. And it makes it a very weird holiday for me because a lot of people like to go outside and, and enjoy festivities. But I really can't go outside and go fishing in a lot of places because they're just so packed. And so what ends up happening is, and then because of this podcast and stuff, I usually get to go fishing during, I guess, better times of the week when it's less crowded. But when the 4th of July comes around, it's like, ah, do, do I really want to go out fishing where there's going to be about 6 trillion people? And could you imagine like going to a Lake Anna or a Deep Creek Lake or a Smith Mountain Lake 4th of July weekend? Oh my God. You know, hats off to you people that actually did that. But but for me, I didn't get to go. I didn't get to go fishing uh, over the Fourth of July weekend <clears throat> for the reasons I just talked about. You know, let me know in the chat if you actually got to go fishing this past week. Uh, but I did get to actually go out uh, today also to try to try to do a little creek fishing to kind of get my head right for tonight's for tonight's stream. And then I, I made a post about this on uh, Instagram and also the YouTube channel. I broke one of the rods I was going to show off today and lost the popper that I was going to talk about uh so but i have the reel i have the reel still so that's a that's a good thing and i have some more tackle we can talk about but i mean them them's the breaks uh but yeah a little housekeeping stuff and then please let me know in the comment section down below how's the volume as i'm rambling here like an absolute idiot let me know in the comment section down below if i need to turn my volume up if i need to turn my volume down before we kind of get to the juice of the subject and also let me know if there's any topic specifically that you'd also like me to cover here this week is also big because of iCast. Uh, iCast is this week. And as you can tell that I'm in this basement headquarters, I'm not going to iCast this year physically. What we're going to do is Jared and Jenny of Jake's Bait and Tackle, they are going to go down to iCast and they're taking a bunch of my equipment. I'm going to be live streaming the iCast on Thursday and Friday. On Wednesday, we're going to be doing a lot of short form content. Again, on Thursday and Friday, we'll be doing an all day live stream or a couple hour clip live stream of a walkthrough. And we're also going to go over the best in tackle. And that kind of leads us into the first question for today is what are people excited about for ICAST this year? You know, let me know in the comment section down below. Volume is a little low, but not bad. Don't worry, David. That's why we're here. Crank it up a little bit there. All right, Dave, let me know now. I just cranked it up some. Just let me know how the volume is before we get into it. Okay, perfect. It's better. Awesome, awesome, awesome. All right, cool. When fi <clears throat> we got Stephen Lloyd fishing. Uh, went fishing at sunup twice at Dam 4. It was a zoo by noon each day. Sounds good, man. Okay, perfect. Yeah, and that's the thing is um, also I got to fish my first uh, Thursday nighter at Dam 4 with a good friend, Cole. You know, huge shout out. You know who you are. I don't know if you want all the fame by uh, me saying your full name on air. So I, I don't want to, I don't want to give you too much fame if you don't want it, if you're not ready for it now, but Cole, thank you so much for coming out with me. It was really fun to fish it. We didn't catch any, Oh no, we caught two keepers. <clears throat> we caught two keepers and let them go. It was a tough day out there. Uh, we caught a bunch of dinks though, a bunch of 10 inch smallmouth. It was a tough day. It really was, but yeah, it, it, it's such a zoo out there on the holiday weekends. It, it's so weird as an outdoorsman where, I would rather be outside on my holidays, but because it's so crowded on the water and I'm not knocking that there are some people that's the only time they can actually get out there. Curtis Cole, my man. Okay. Well, he actually a huge shout out to Curtis Cole. He actually got me out of bed, so to speak, and uh, got me to go with him to do the Thursday night jackpot at Dan four. That was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. It was fun to get back out on the water. 
But anyway, my point is like, I'm not, I'm not mad about it in the sense that sometimes it's the only time those people can actually get out there. But it is interesting, like on holiday weekends, I don't get to go outside as much. It's more of like, let's do chores around the house. Let me get some more video editing done, things of that ilk. And then once the holiday weekend is over, I'm going to go outside and actually try to go enjoy the outdoors a little bit more. And this time of year, there's no better activity, I think, than creek fishing. And I think last year I did a uh, river fishing 101, and I kind of wanted to do kind of a little creek fishing 101. And I'll link in the episode description. If you want more about creek fishing adventures, I mean, the guy's title's right there. Go go see John Dalton's Creek Fishing Adventures channel. He's the man. He's been doing it forever. He's a really, really good dude. He can get you even more in-depth stuff. But this is just going to be kind of my little rundown of what I like to go fishing with creeks. We talked a little bit about iCast already. That On Thursday, we're going to be doing an all-day live stream. And we're going to be doing a little bit of live streaming on uh, on Friday as well. <clears throat> so, good stuff there. And then we talked, you know, about any kind of equipment that you're excited for. Now, I think what's really interesting about that is how Berkeley had a recall in their swim bait. They had a recall in their mag draft. Ooh, I'm sorry. We can't call it that. Can't call it the mag draft. But they had a full recall on their mag draft lookalike. And I was thinking, talking to some friends, when was the last time Berkeley innovated? They have a lot of baits that feel like they're copycats. Like they're not, they're not inventing anything new. They're not trying to make risks. Everything just seems like it's a copy of the copy. And, and before people start typing, yeah, I get that. That happens a lot in the industry where people like everyone copies everyone. Yeah, I, I get that. But you look at the mega bass and they make stuff that just seems new and inventive to an extent. Whereas, or even Z-Man, like some of the products we're talking about now, they're kind of, they're kind of mimicking their own products, but they're using it in different ways. And I feel like that makes it newish, but I could be, I could be completely wrong. Let me know. But it's just interesting with Berkeley, how I feel like they're almost like, and I think they were declaring bankruptcy if I'm not mistaken, or having some financial trouble, but it's just interesting to me that they're just seem to be like losing some of their luster lately. And it's just interesting to me. And that also goes back to mega bass being a Japanese company. And I think that's where a lot of the innovation is right now is in Japanese companies compared to, American companies that just seem like they're in this creative wall when it comes to fishing, where it's like, let's just make copies of a copy. I think you see that also in like the electronics where Lawrence is really big on this, where I feel like they looked at Apple and it's like, wait a minute, we could take the same iPhone and we could just make it iPhone 14, 15, 16, 17 is pretty much the same phone. We're going to slap a different camera on it. Boom, $2,000 right there. And so the electronics haven't necessarily got increasingly better from each one, but the price tag is the same or more, but there's not like this big whoa factor. And I just find that very interesting. But then again, that's not always the norm. Like Garmin will come out with a forward-facing sonar, boom, and they blow up the industry. Hummingbird will come out with a turret and blow up the industry. But I just, I've always found that kind of fascinating with how electronics also getting that little bit of a rut where there's nothing new they can do necessarily. So they just make these small incremental changes, which really doesn't affect you. And then, you know, the, the planned, ob, you know, ob, obsolete, obsolescence, adolescence, whatever that word is for like shit will eventually break that you're seeing more in electronics now. But I don't know why I'm rambling on about that. I just, I just think that's very, very interesting with the whole industry and, and where that, where that's headed. But you know, that's enough about ICAST. Let's get into some Creek fishing stuff. Um, and we'll also talk about where we go and, and things of that ilk. So creek fishing to me, it, it really is. I have, a, I have a ranger boat, old one. I'm not sponsored. I'm not a fancy person or any shit like that. It's like a 1999 ranger that still works. So like, you know, I'm just going to check my privilege there. And I also have a kayak. So I get to fish from a kayak, did really well in a tournament, fish out of the ranger boat, do tournaments there. But something that really is just kind of like my peanut butter and jelly, something I really I still find so much enjoyment in, and it's kind of like my happy place after work is wading creeks in the summertime. It is so it's therapeutic almost. And I will, I have a backpack. I'll, I'll pull it over here and I'll show it to you, but I have a backpack. I carry all my supplies in it, pair of pliers, put my Bluetooth headsets in. If I want to listen to a podcast or some music and I can just wait a stream. 
and it's so much fun. So, you know, let's kind of like get into the nitty gritty of it here. And let's just first start out like with what do you need to do this? And we're going to specifically target the summertime. I want to break this up into segments because I don't use waiters really in the summertime. And I know in the fall, the winter of duh, and then in the, in the most of the spring, you really need them. And I always want to start there. If you're a kid and you're going to want to wade some creeks. And I saw this two years ago it was may early may the air temperature was about 70 75 it was short weather it was feeling pretty good out and i went to the conica jig creek i think it was like the first once i just moved out to hagerstown i think and i was like i'm just gonna go wade this creek and it was a little bit more swollen and if you guys don't know the conica jig it's a fairly it's almost like a small river it's pretty wide and in the spring which I really think the spring for most creeks is really up until early May to mid mid May, you have all that rain. So it's a little bit more swollen, but the water is still insanely cold. And I got out there and I started waiting. And I didn't realize that like, the water is still freaking frigid to be in, in shorts. And the water's a little bit higher than I thought. It's high enough that like the transmission is underwater. Okay. And when it, when it felt that cold, it was, it was something crazy, but you know, I was trying to like, I was trying to tough it out. Well, then I kept getting out there and then all of a sudden I can't feel my legs anymore. Like I am cold. I am cold, cold. And I am up almost to my belly button in this water. Like I literally cannot feel my legs. It's so cold. And again, this is like late, this is like late April, first, first week of May. And I get to the other side of the bank and I have to get out of the water and just defall. And if it wasn't for the air temperature being in the 70s, you know, I could have easily probably gotten hypothermia. And I, and I think it's so easy to have this happen to you because you look around, the turkeys are gobbling, everything's lush green, the sun is out finally, it feels warm. And you think like, it's just a little creek. It's not that big a deal. It's not the Potomac River. It's not the Shenandoah. It's just a little creek. But a lot of these creeks still run much colder than, than these other bodies of water. So just be aware of the temperature and just follow the kayak protocol. You know, you, you need the water above, you need the water above 60 degrees. You need the air temperature. I like to say above 70 degrees just to make sure that you stay safe out there. And then once you get into pure summertime, you're fine. But if you're going to wade stuff in the springtime and going into the fall, that's where I think you're going to have your issue. And in my mind, it's more deadly in the spring than the fall. And this is and hear my logic out here in the fall. A lot of times the water temperature will be a little bit warmer, de depending will be a little bit warmer. And then the air temperature will drop first then the water temperature. And you, like I'm just saying, like you have those random days where that'll happen. Well, the, the water temperature is still going to feel pretty good. So you're going to get in there. In the spring, what screwed me over was I was thinking like, well, it's the air temperature feels really good, so I'm going to commit to it. But the water is still like, nah, we're still a couple weeks behind, dude. So, but in either case, be very, very careful when you get out there in the spring or the fall to wade. And then we'll talk about waders in, in that next episode when we do it. In the fall, in the spring, or sorry, in the summer though, get yourself a good pair of wading boots is what I like, or an old pair of tennis shoes that still works good. I prefer, I use just some old Dick Sporting Goods uh, wading shoes, and then I use uh, wading socks. If you don't have wading socks, use an old pair of socks. The, the socks are going to help keep sand, and it's going to help keep rocks and all that debris out of your shoes, and that's super important to have that happen. Make sure you get an extra pair of socks to wear under there. Now, you might want to wear flip-flops or sandals. Do not do that. If you get all those rocks and crap in there, you're going to be picking them out 24 seven. You're going to slip on something hard. You want something with a little bit of thickness around your foot to protect it. That's why I'm saying old hiking shoes, hiking boots, things like that. That's, that's what you really want to start with before you go out there into the water. Now, besides that, next thing you're going to do is like, well, okay, should I wear shorts? Well, where are you going to be waiting? If you're going to be waiting and to get to the place, you're going to be going through a lot of brush, a lot of thick grass. Go buy yourself a pair of sun pants. Under Armour makes them, Sims make them, Columbia makes them. You want those long pants to keep ticks, 
poison ivy and all those creepy bugs out. Especially if you're going to be waiting some of the places we're talking about, like Goose Creek or any creek on an old farm. Lyme's disease is a thing. It is a silent killer. My sister has Lyme's disease and Graves' disease because of it. Make sure you wear long pants to keep the ticks away. It's just you're going to thank me in the long run. Now, if you're fishing a place where you're not going to get out of the water, if you're not going to have to traverse a lot of thick brush poison ivy and that stuff, okay, you can use shorts. There's no problem there. But having a nice pair of sun pants, just it really it's just that extra layer of protection. And plus, a bunch of them have extra pockets. So you could put maybe a pair of pliers or something like that in there. Now, I'm going to bring out my first piece of gear. I don't know, honestly, why I was wearing those headphones when I have no one to talk to, but it's forced habit. So what I got here, this is just an old backpack. But the key to the old backpack here that I have is you want all your pockets and you want something up top. Because what you can put up here is your cell phone or your sunglasses right up on top. Anything that's going to be as high away from the water column as possible, closer to your neck. So I can put my battery and it's charger right up here. So it's good to go. It's going to stay high and dry. Then what I do... I hook a carabiner up here. Oh. And I put a little retracting cord. So that way I can pull my pliers out from there and I can let go and it'll snap back. And then I attach this. And then I'll, what I'll also attach is my Palomar knot clip. That way I can adjust a knot on the go if I want to. This right here, I can tie a braid to, braid to leader not super duper quick. I don't need my toes. And then I will also take with me a pair of braid snips. You can buy these at any kind of Michael's store. Like I like to go with the Michael's ones because they're super cheap. This is like $2.99 when you get them on sale there versus if you go to like Dick's Sporting Goods and get Rapala braid cutters are like 30 bucks or something crazy like that. That's really important to get yourself some cutters. And that's for your backpack. Now, So when it comes to baits, this is what I want you to think about. You want to go as minimalist as possible when you're wading a creek and really anticipate what you're going to be doing first before you get there. And, I, and there's a reason for that is because you're not going to be, you don't want to carry too much gear in a wading circumstance compared to a bank fishing pond circumstance. So if I'm fishing a pond, let's say, let's say the pond in Winchester. And if you guys know that Wilkins Pond, you know what? I'll get this up for you guys just so you have a better idea of what it looks like. Google map. This want you to give you an idea of what I'm, what, what, where my mind is at, and I'll do it with visuals. I think that'll help. Well, I don't know about you guys, but it's going to help me a lot. Get it up here. Perfect. All right. This is Jim Burnett Park in Winchester. And so if you look at the Jim Burnett Park in Winchester, Wil Wilkins Lake, there's a massive concrete walkway through this whole pond. You can basically walk the whole pond, no problem. A place like this. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Chris, what does one consider too much gear? I didn't know there was such a thing. I'm going to get into a. am going to get into a big dog and get into it. So if you're fishing a pond where you have a central point that you start and stop the day with, you can go around the whole pond. You can switch gear out. I think you can carry three or four rods with you. And this is kind of what I mean. You got to think down like, which rod am I going to carry first? And that kind of can get into your baits. If you're waiting a Creek where you might be waiting up that Creek for six miles, it's not a lot of fun to carry two or three rods. It's just not. Now you can get a, a loop strap wrap that you can put on the side, but it's just not as much fun when you're waiting. And then it's one more thing that can break. Um, but it's a really cool little thing. It's like a holster for a rod that you can wear on you. I, I've tried it. And to me, I'm not, maybe I'll do a review of it someday, but it's just, it, it's okay. But it can get frustrating when you're waiting and you could slip and then fall on top of your rod and break it. Plus you're going underneath trees and stuff and that thing's sticking straight up in the air, but it does give you the ability to have a, a second rod having a little holster. But what I like to do is just anticipate what I'm going to be using. And then based on that, that's the gear I'm going to use. So what I'm going to first get into is the rods and then how I pair with those rods when we use. So 
First up here, my BFS bait casting setup. Okay, this is the suppressor made by Old 18 Outfitters. This is an ultralight seven foot bait casting setup. And what makes this so much fun is I, I spool this thing up with eight pound test and you can use uh, the new the new Coriato BFS by Shimano or you could just use like the, the TWS Daiwa uh, Zillion series. That works really good too, but you want a little bit higher in spinning our, our bait caster setup to be able to handle the eight pound line. What I like about this is I can flip and pitch a bait, a heavier jig if I want to, so I don't have to cast over the top. But what makes this thing super excellent is throwing it with crankbaits and small jerk baits. So if I'm going to be throwing little crankbaits, little swim baits, things like that, I'm going to be taking that rod set up there. It's my absolute favorite. It's so much fun. And then what I really like is these bomber flat A's and these and these killer b setups these things are super duper small and to give you a comparison here's a little sharpie you know there's the bait just to give you some context of the size these things are super duper small but on an eight pound test man you can just fling those things and having that ultra light uh bfs setup dude that thing's like a parabolic cranking rod and it's so much fun and you can just absolutely dig that thing in there and they just load up on it the other thing that you can throw a lot is a baby jerk bait. Love those too. So if I'm going to be throwing specifically crank baits, mini jerk baits, or top water baits, which is what I wanted to talk about today, but I just sent it to the I sent it to I sent it into a tree and I never got it back. And I broke the rod that I was using that on. Uh the the Mega Bass Baby Pop X is so much fun to throw those little poppers on an ultralight uh, bait casting setup. Don't throw it on a medium light spinning rod for the specific reason. When I casted it out, I didn't stop it in time. I didn't close the bail and that was a whole ordeal today. Got the reel though. And so that's where I really like having that BFS setup where you can just thumb it and stop it. So Tom, what's the point here? Well, if I know that's all I'm going to be throwing is some top waters and like more moving baits, I'm going to put all that stuff in my one box. I'm going to pack light. And then I'm good to go. Now, if I'm not going to do that, I have another setup. This here is my ultralight. And then of this same brand, um, this is the this is the Shakespeare. This is a five and a half, this is a five and a half foot ultralight rod. Really good. And I pair this with the same reel that I do with my medium light version. I go with 12 to 14 pound main braid and I want to go with eight to six pound fluorocarbon right there. Boom, bang. And what I like to throw on this bad boy here are my super duper light stuff like my my Berkeley gulp. I'm going to use a trout magnet hook on that thing. This thing will catch everything. And I think this is this is also gets into the point of like what type of base do you like to throw on a creek versus a river. When I am fishing a creek. I am trying to get anything to bite. It's not just a small mouth. I love catching rock bass and big suckers and things like that. So I'm not, I'm not necessarily wanting to throw a chatterbait. You can throw a chatterbait or a swim jig or things like that. I just enjoy catching variety of species when I'm fishing creeks. Particularly, I've caught wild trout, believe it or not, before when you throw these smaller baits. So I will not be talking about the chatterbaits and things like that or bigger jerk baits. Not because you can't throw them and have success. You could, but I just enjoy being able to catch like the little rock bass suckers and things like that. So now let's pretend the same rod is my medium light. This gets into the fun stuff and what I really like to throw with that. So move that out of the way there. All right, here are the first couple of baits. Number one, we're going to go with the two inch Kai Tech. You're going to take that two inch Kai tech and you're going to, you're going to pair that thing on a Kai tech jig hook. And you're going to usually go with a one fourth ounce. That's usually the, the best size and then epoxy that thing. You're going to be able to throw that thing and just slow roll it back. No problem at all. And this thing will catch rock bass. It'll catch bluegill and it'll catch some monster Creek smallmouth. a really simple bait to use really easy to work with. 
That's number one. I absolutely love that one. And then now we're going to get into the Z-Man products. This right here has probably absolutely, this is the completely revolutionized my creek fishing is the micro TRD. This thing is an absolute fish catching machine. And just to give you some idea about the size right there. Boom. It is, it is so small. I mean, it is the tiniest little morsel possible. But the thing that makes this, it, it's a game changer for me, is I used to throw any, like, I used to throw uh, a trick worm and I cut it down. I use that as my net rig. The problem is you have so many rock bass and little bluegill and suckers that would tear it off the hook. Now that you have that Elastec, one bait can pretty much last you all day. Now, the key with this bait, though, is not just the bait, but the right type of hook. And again, what I like to go with is that Kitech Custom Tungsten Super Round Jig Head. One fourth ounce is a little heavy for this one here. I would go like one sixteenth or even lighter. And I'll link in the episode description when I re-upload this, all the sizes and things like that. But you're going to go with that super duper light jig head. But what's so important is you get this light jig head, but you get a you get a gaff of a hook on that thing. I don't know if you guys can see that, but that's a heck of a hook that you get on there. So you're able to really slam home when you actually get bit. Same old standard colors. Um, green pumpkin is absolutely banging. You can also go with a lighter head and you can go with white. I found white or even chartreuse heads can also get a few more bites. But what's so nice about this is you can also bite it down. You can bite this thing down and then you can have basically like a little trout magnet too, but it's also completely indestructible. Now, what I, I used to use as an ultralight for this, but the problem I found out is in creeks, you still have some big damn smallmouth and largemouth in there. And what would happen, and and Cole and I had this issue, believe it or not, when we were fishing the, um, you know, I'm actually going to, I'm giving away way too much juice here. I'm going to get in trouble, but uh, Curtis Cole and I were fishing the, the, the Thursday night jackpot at Dan four on the upper Potomac. And we caught, I think 30 smallmouth, and they were all like 11 inches. <laughs> I think we only caught one keeper uh, out of that, that area that we were fishing. And it was on this bait here. And what's funny is of those 30, we probably hooked about 50 in total, but only 30 to the boat because I was using an ultralight and I immersed, I missed the first 10. I couldn't get them into the boat because they would hit this thing and they would just absolutely bow this rod and I couldn't get the hook into them. And then, and then Cole was like, listen, um, I have a medium light. So I cut the bait off. I tossed it to him and he starts yoking on them. So that medium light rod is insanely important. An ultralight has too much parabolic action. When you cast that bait way far away from you to set the hook, the rod's going to bow. And if it's a bigger fish, their ability to hold that bait, they can squeeze the bait down harder than you can actually put pressure on them with that ultralight rod. So I highly suggest if you're throwing this one, to go up to like a medium light spinning rod outfit. It's just going to give you a little bit more backbone, but you're going to still have fun with it. The next thing is to set your drag. And I think this is insanely important when, when if you want to have fun with creek fishing. Make sure you get yourself a very smooth... Where did I put that reel? You want to make sure you get yourself a very, very, very smooth reel. This is um this is a Arby Garcia AB. I think it's a RG200 dial a reel but it's got 10 ball bearings in it which is insanely important just for your drag this thing has insanely smooth drag for its price point you know it's not like a steez or something like that you don't need that but you don't want just your walmart brand either because with this i can still use six pound leader all the way down to four if i want to and if i set the hook on them and they run it, it's still going to be smooth enough drag that i'm not going to break so that's just very important to kind of keep in mind a couple other baits I really like, and this is specifically for creek fishing, is the the micro TRD. This is basically their their sweet beaver version look alike. This is an absolute banger, and my favorite. And this came out a while ago. This is the TRD tube. This is the tiny tube. You guys might recognize this from my uh, video two years ago where I was at Wilkinson Pond in the wintertime and I absolutely smoked them. This thing is absolutely fantastic on a on a ball head jig or just a straight jig. Throw it on there and just hit it with a touch of super glue. Boom, and you're good to go. 
And then if I'm feeling really frisky and the water's a little bit deeper, I'm going to go with a micro jig. It doesn't have to be the Z-Man one either. Now you might be saying like, Tom, why do you have so many Z-Man products here? I really like the elastic nature, especially when you're dealing with a lot of bluegill. And, and specifically because I'm not just trying to target bass, I'm, I'm trying to target rock, rock bass and bluegill. Red-breasted sunfish and creeks are so much fun to catch. They're so much fun. That elastic is so great because I don't have to constantly put new baits on. When you're wading a creek, you want to keep the gear to a minimum so you can move forward. That backpack, I'm also keeping snacks in. I'm also keeping extra waters in so I can keep moving. I can hydrate. I'm bug spray. I'm keeping in there as well. Sunscreen, all that's got to be in there. So I can't carry too much tackle because when I'm wade, wading a creek, I'm not just taking six steps and we're done. I'm going to probably walk a mile to two miles up that thing. And so having this elastic is great because once I dab it with some super glue, this thing is pretty much on there. And I really don't have to worry too much about losing my bait and having to retie. So just keep that in mind with the elastic. And then of course, I always keep some gulp with me. Uh, a little bit of gulp and there's two different flavors, if you will. You're going to go with your, I don't even know what color this is. I just call it the natural color. But then I also have my chartreuse, my chartreuse tipped gulp. And these are, this is the, the one inch version. I keep this anytime I go to a creek because this is like crack. If they're not eating this stuff, then there's no fish in that creek, period. And that's kind of like my bait assortment there. I have a couple more that I'll throw every now and then. What I'll also do is I'll also take a Kai Tech or any kind of Mega Bass swim bait, the two inch version, and I'll nose hook it as well. I'll take that thing there, nose hook it, jerk baits, same thing, soft plastic jerk bait. And what you're going to use is a number one got to, just like that. Boom. That works really well there. And then where is my last bait? Oh, it's over there. I'm going to take a three inch Cinco, a three inch Cinco and a three inch trick worm. I like the zoom finesse trick worm and then a three inch Cinco. And I'll take a bag of those as well. But instead of using like a, a one out hook, what I really like to do is I'll use the Gamagatsu drop shot hook that I showed you earlier. And again, I go with the size one. Size one right there. The reason I like to go with this versus the weedless setup is when I'm fishing a creek, I really feel like I'm going to be fishing more of the riffles and the bulge and things of that ilk. And I want that thing to be hooked right through, right dead nest through the center, cast it out and let it do its weightless fall action. Again, it just kind of depends. Now, if I'm going to be throwing that, that's going to be on my medium light setup. That's not going to be on my ultralight or something like that. But those are kind of like all my baits. I'm going to go with that sink. I'm going to have that there if I want to try to get something a little bit bigger. I'm going to go with the swim bait or a weedless or a fluke, weedless fluke, or a fluke hooked through the nose of the bait. That's going to be more of my top water action or a mega bass, like Pop X or a, a micro jerk bait by Rapala. Those are kind of my baits right now that I'm going to be throwing. The jerk bait really is going to come into play in the spring and the fall. And then I'm also throwing a little bit heavier Ned rig in the spring. I caught some bangers. I think I caught 10 pounds of smallmouth out of a creek. That was my best five, which is insane for a creek. And I was in the spring during the pre-spawn time. That time though, I wasn't using a weightless like bait. It was, it was throwing a little bit heavier jig. But those are my baits. What are yours? Let me get some comments answered here. Three inch Cinco weightless T rig. Ah, I just personal preference. Maybe I get a smaller one here. We'll go with this one. Um, I just like going weight. I like going weightless. I really like going weightless and just going wacky with it. I just like that shimmy a little bit more when this water, because that's the other thing too, is like the water is really low right now. And I feel like that weightless fall of the wacky worm is just dynamite right now. But that's just personal preference. And of course, like, I mean, you've kicked my butt with the, uh, with certain baits that you like going Texas because that works too. And I'd be remiss to say like another great bait this time of year. And this is something else that I like to hook weightless wacky style. Um, is the flatworm. 
that can be absolutely banging right now. Again, I like to go with that one on hook that I just lost, which I'm going to find tomorrow while I'm working, probably, which will hurt a lot. There it is. Right there, nose hook that thing, cast it out, and just let it sink. Again, weightless. It's about your presentation still, even in a creek. And the other thing is about stealth. When I fish a creek, generally speaking, I like to work up, up river. Don't go down. You can still catch them going down. I'm not saying that. If, if you have an entry point, you can only go down river. I get it. Walk as far down as you can and then work your way back. God, you're probably going to get a bit more, but then you're going to be able to present baits way, way better. Um, I like to start smaller, especially if you're dealing with kids and trying to get kids into the fishing. Things that hook. Okay. Sorry. Uh, my wife just sent me a text thing. Let's see what she said here. I'll bring this, show this board. She said, uh, everyone should take a shot every time that you say things of that ilk. I really like it when she calls me on that shit. I guess that's something. Everyone, please take a shot every time I say that. But yeah, the weightless, the weightless setup is way better, I think, in shallower water. You can get more action for it. It's going to have better buoyancy. It's going to it's gonna have more drag because you have the, the fulcrum point of if that bait is hooked dead nuts in the center like that the weight's pulling it down this way and that's going to create more drag and it's going to create more of a fluttering action. But that's what I like. What are yours? Yeah. Let's answer some questions right here. I like the Berkeley little general on a Ned rig. Berkeley general is really good on a Ned rig. Um, I I've thrown that. Oh, the Nico Bay is also really good on a Ned rig. Only problem I have with the Berkeley one on the Ned rig is it's a little bit thicker for creeks. Again, we're speaking just strictly creeks right now, not rivers. I'm not talking about the Susquehanna River. I'm not talking about the Upper Potomac or the Shenandoah. That's a completely different thing about the baits that I'm going to throw. I'm talking about little creeks that you're waiting, where you might catch a bluegill, you might catch a bass. That's the only difference there. And that's why I kind of like going with these, these little bit smaller, smaller baits like that. Bass and what's up, basser? What up, guys? No, and then we also talked about, before you guys, for the new people that just entered, We've been talking about creek fishing, kind of the baits that I really like to throw in creeks. We also talked about iCast, that on Thursday we're going to be live streaming iCast right here at Fishing the DMV. If there's a product that you'd really like to see, let us know. We also talked about a little bit about the 4th of July weekend and what happened over there and how like it's an absolute shit show on the water on the 4th of July weekend and how brave you are to go out there. We also talked about creek fishing tactics and baits and things of that oak. And I said it again, shots, shots, everybody, shots. Bucktail crappy jig. That's a banger. I do like how people mention baits. I have like this magic box over here and I just keep pulling the shit out people are talking about. But yeah, like little bucktail jigs like that. That's always a lot of fun to throw. Uh, Stephen Floyd always enjoyed wading a creek with a rooster tail or maps. Oh my gosh, dude. I really need to throw those. I have not thrown a rooster tail in forever. The how do you get rid of the line twist though? Or is that just something you deal with? I would assume you're going to throw that thing on straight floor carpet, right? Or do you put like a snap swivel or something above that? I feel like you would need a snap swivel or something just to keep the line twist down. I think it's crazy though that Berkeley's having a recall on their big bait. But wouldn't it be cool if they actually like, I don't know, came out with something brand new? I thought Strike King just created a new crankbait and it's like, that looks like a rock crawler. Like you're literally, it just looks like you're just stealing the rock crawler and Mark Zona has to hype this thing up. It's like, this is completely cool. It's like, that's ah, kind of like it's done. It's kind of the same thing, but maybe it's a little bit different. Who knows? And let's see what was the last thing that I had. And then the last thing is a micro popping frog. And then what I do is I go to the fly tying shop and I rip the tails out and I thread uh, feathers in there. Just to give it a little bit more action. Congrats in your MLBA win yesterday, David. Dude, I didn't even know you won. Awesome. Congratulations. And then, guys, thank you so much for watching the um, uh, the Bob Petty episode today. It did extremely well on the channel, and I really appreciate everyone for giving him love. He was a fantastic interview, and I really enjoyed being able to sit down and talk with him. He puts on a great organization, the Potomac Teams, and he is a wealth of knowledge. Him and like Charlie Taylor are just they are two gems that we have in our area that have seen it all and done it all. So huge respect to them and their organizations. And then also thank you guys for everyone that watched the hidden gems episode. That one is trending. 
right now on Google, it's one of the top three things that you can find if you search Leaders Lake. And that's really cool to know that I'm back in the top of the algorithm for hidden gems. Every time I launch a hidden gem, it, it goes viral. And I really appreciate all the love that that's gotten. Um, it was emotional to do that lake. It really was. That was a lake I got to fish since I was a wee kid. And to be able to fish a tournament there, you know, huge shout out to Mike Ortega and Northern Virginia Kayak Association for putting on that tournament. It was cool to actually go there and fish a tournament. And some of the people in the comment section are saying, like, are you saying like Sleeters like can like beat Aquaquan? It's like, no, Aquaquan is way better. Like, like pound for pound. It's like one's a lightweight, one's a heavyweight. Aquaquan is pumping out numbers that are absurd. I think the last, I think yesterday's Fountainhead tournament, I think 25 pounds didn't even get you in the top 10. <laughs> I mean, that place is, Aquaquan Reservoir right now is literally in its prime. It, it This is going to be the best days ever right now, I think, for the Aquaquan Reservoir. It's insane. It's just interesting that Sleaters Lake was able to put out the numbers that it did, and it still does for a 100-acre lake. And I really wanted to bring it back to the grass because I heard that the homeowners associations wanted to dump pesticides in there to kill all the grass because it doesn't look good. And I really wanted to kind of blend that into an episode to be like, hey, if you do that, this place will suck. Don't kill the grass, please. But that gets into a whole other issue about homeowners associations coming in. And... It, it, do homeowners associations know that they're the evil empire? You know, there's that 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 old British skit, um, or maybe it's a Monty Python skit with with the Nazis, and they're like, "Are we the baddies? Are we the bad guys?" And I feel like do do the homeowners associations ever have that self awareness at meetings where they look at each other and be like, "Are we the baddies? Are we the bad guys?" I there's a fantastic article that was on Northern Virginia uh, fishing Facebook page. They talk about Lake Manassas and how basically it's so expensive for the rich people to keep all of us out <laughs> of the lake and how much they pay to just basically keep it a private aquarium that you can't be on. And it's absolutely insane how much money they spend to keep people out of Lake Manassas. And I don't think Lake Manassas, I don't think they'll ever in our time will let us back on there. But the fact that that article and you read it and it's like they want they pay to keep people off of it is stupid. And you look at Sleuthers Lake and they put in a boat ramp, but if the doc talk again, it's, it's allegedly, if they want to put pesticide in there to kill all the grass and stuff, it's just like, you guys are literally the evil empire and you've got to have some optics here. The way this looks, it looks so bad. And I really hope one day, like some of these homeowners association will get it together. These, these, these developers and be like, let's do this. Let's build a wildlife refuge. We'll put houses up to the wildlife refuge that we created, but we're going to be like friendly to outdoors people and not give them the middle finger. Or I don't know, build a lake, but like put in a public boat ramp and not make it private. It's just such a, it's such an obvious social win that you could do for the community, but it's just like, they don't care. And I, and I get that. And I'm pissing into the wind about that, but it's just, it's just interesting. I grew up in Western Loudoun County. And I used to do a lot of hunting growing up, a ton of hunting. And when I get my new studio and we finally move out of the uh, the place that we're renting right now, I'll have all my, my deer heads and stuff. I used to hunt a lot. And then developers came in and they built up houses and then wineries and vineyards came in by the thousands. And then all of a sudden you couldn't actually hunt anymore. And they, they basically stopped it because progress and that's what happens. And it's just really depressing to me when that, that stuff happens. Bassin with big old. A huge golf course lake and won't let folks fish it. A bunch of lakes in VA like that. Yeah, but, but this article was just, it, it's insane to me, the sheer hubris of it. And honestly, I'm just going to get it up right now. Because I think this is important enough. We'll, we'll just go through it uh, together. Is like if I try to find the damn thing. Can I find the article that I was tagged in? That honestly would have been really good. Oh, here it is. Why you can't swim or boat on Lake Manassas. And I love how this article first starts with swimming in lakes because who's actually done that? in the last 10 years, but everyone's terrified. People just want to go swimming in lakes. Why you can't swim or boat on Lake Manassas closed off for 10 years. Some want Lake Manassas reopened to the public. 
So I just love how this this article is first like some want the lake to be reopened to the public. That is such a pretentious asshole. Like some peasants out there are are worried that the the private lake for us mere upper class they cannot access it. We have heard these peasants bitch enough, and so we'll just say the little people. Someone, something wants this lake opened. I wonder why. You can look at it and stand on its banks in and fish in it. But whatever you do, don't boat or swim in Lake Manassas. And I, so, I, guys, enjoy this line here. And this is, again, why I, this is, you can look at it. That is a California, I come from money or a big city, and I just bought a big-ass house, and I want to be able to take Instagram photos to send to all my girlfriends. You can look at the lake. You, that's not illegal there. But, God damn it, do not get out on the water. Do not get on that water. You can stare at it and you can take photos, but do not touch the water. The lake remains closed to the public this summer, as it has for every summer since 2004. Manassas officials say they must do everything to protect the city's drinking water, the supply from contaminants, or the invasive zebra mussel. How many lakes, believe it or not, can you actually fish that are public drinking water? There's a lot of them. So this is a bullshit argument because Beaver Dam Reservoir, I believe, is also public drinking water. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Chad, help me out. The Baltimore lakes that you have to pay a shit ton of money to get a boat into, you can still fish them. You can still boat on them. And that's public drinking water for Baltimore. So Manassas, are you saying that you're more important than Baltimore? Who has more people in it? Is it Baltimore or is it Manassas? Hmm. It almost feels like that's a fall guy. So that feels like a little BS to me. Cool. Those who get caught in the lake risk br breaking the law. Oh, my God. You go to prison, what'd you do? I sold drugs. You, I murdered a guy. What did you do? I went fishing on a lake. Five to life, yo. But many who live on or near our 770-acre reservoir. By the way, that's insane how big that place is, and you can't fish it. That is criminal. This is not like a 50-acre dinky little reservoir. This is a massive body of water that they have to patrol. Like, a Sleater's Lake is 100 acres. Think about that for a minute. Think about that. And Sherwood, that's a damn good point. He's caught us in the, in the con. Aquan Reservoir is Fairfax drinking water. Yeah, and you can run a big engine with gasoline on that place, and they don't give a shit. Like, this is such a BS argument to start with. Uh, other reservoirs in the area, like Stafford's new Rocky Pine Reservoir, allow non-motorized boats, kayak fishing, but no swimming. I love how swimming comes up there. It's like, I grew up in a time where you could go swimming at lakes. It was, I was more, I was, I was raised country. Basically you did that sort of thing. Who in Manassas is actually going to go swimming in a lake. You have pools and stuff like that generation. I feel like is dying off the, the lake swimmers and the river swimmers. So very wise. Isn't the Potomac river drinking water for most. Lakes? Yeah. The Potomac river is too. Yeah. The Potomac river. And that's what I'm saying. Like it's such a, I saw in this comment thread about everyone's like, well, it's drinking water. It's like bullshit. Like you're drinking out of the Potomac. People piss in that thing. Like it's people run big engines. You don't know what stuff is being drained down there. It's fine. It's not going to be an issue. They use that as a fall guide because if anyone wants to pass laws, they use safety as the issue. That's how they get around it. But well, for your safety, we have to do this to you. Uh, yeah. Those who want the lake reopened say similar rules could be implemented at the Lake Manassas. So I like how they're saying like certain rules, like you can't have a motorized boat when it's already been debunked that you can have motorized boats. The issue with motorized boats, let's be honest here, and I get this more from a safety factor, is you would have to have like a 10 horsepower issue. Otherwise, you're going to have wake boaters and you're going to have lunatics on jet skis running around. And could you believe if the res had jet skis or a bunch of wake boats or something like that it'd be insane because it's just not big enough for that so that i kind of get um or you'd have to do like a 10 horsepower restriction which is i'm fine with too but okay let's just say let's assume that you can only use electric motors and you could boat and do electric motors okay fine fair enough that's fine at least you can fish it those who want to reopen the lake say rules could be implemented at the lake manassas the city currently oh boy now th this is it right here the city's the city currently budgets $83,000 in funds from its annual budget to police the lake in an effort to keep out the public. Holy shit, Carly. What? Look at this article right here. What? Who, look, 
this is this is this is the state from Manassas. Those who want to reopen the lake say the rules could be implemented at Lake Manassas. The city currently spends eighty thousand dollars a year to keep people off the lake. Whoa. The lake is almost a thousand acres. Can they hire me? Yeah, I I like whole they're spending almost a hundred thousand dollars a year to say stay off it. And this is how this article like starts. And by the way, this is a lake that was bought by a golf course. It's not illegal to look at it. Isn't that the most pretentious thing to say? It's like, no, no, no. You can look at it. I think you did that a yeah. Time. But you, but it's still like, who starts the article like that? It's like, it's not like you can't look at it or something. Like, that's the selling point. It's like, oh, shit, as long as I'm allowed to look at it. That's not, we're not going to incriminate you for that. You just can't touch it. It's like, no, you can look at the horse. You just can't touch it. It's, it's like, that's the big selling point. But I would like to ride there. No, 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 you can't do that. But you can take a picture with it. That's fine. That's absurd to me. Anyway, we're going to get back. <laughs> this is a big ass number. This is the first time I actually read this thing. Probably should have done that beforehand. Fishing is only allowed on, on the bank of Lake Manassas if permission obtained from private property owners. So I love how this is also phrased. We're like, fishing is allowed if you get permission. So it's not even like this is like a public lake. They're like, yeah, you can fish from the lake if you get permission to fish there, which is like a no shit clause. Yeah, you you can you can look at the golf course, but you can't play on it. <laughs> you can look at the jewelry, but you just can't steal it. Who live on the lake? Console console members say that that while concerns over the security and safety of drinking water and zebra mussels are real, just that's BS. Our past experience with the lake shows that it is very unlikely that any type of marine operation which would act as gatekeeper for the lake use would be financially profitable, says the city's person who I don't care about. In the past, the city provided a subsidy to marine operator. None of the new proposals we have seen regarding lake access show that they would be self-sustaining financially. So let me wrap my brain around this real quick. What you're saying is it is cheaper for you to burn $100,000 a year to keep people off the lake. That is more financially responsible than putting in a boat ramp. I need to see the books, please. I don't want just an outlier of, of you saying, no, 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 trust us. Listen, it's cheaper for us to burn $100,000. It's way more financially responsible to do that than to put in a boat ramp. I'm telling you right now, we pay to go the, down the Greenway in Northern Virginia, almost what, five to $10 with a fast pass? Imagine if you had a lake like this, and again, you have an electric kiosk, and this is what they should have. I think I mentioned this with Bob on his show. You have one of the electric kiosks for like Leesylvania boat ramp or, or, or Smallwood State Park or Manassas Lake. You have an electric kiosk. The thing goes down. You have either the electric card reader right there, or you get a puck, and then you drive your boat up at four in the morning. You, you insert your credit card, whatever, five bucks to go into the lake, bing, bang, boom. Gate opens up, you go right through. Boom. You automatically get your money and you get to keep people out of the lake. And guess what? You don't need a person there either. It's that simple. I have always been side tangent. I have never, I've always been blown away by you need somebody there at four in the morning and they ask for like a dollar ninety-eight in exact change, or you can't get in. Or it's like, I want you to take a stamp and a piece of paper and then fold it up and lick it and then stick it in a little mailbox. It is 2023 for the love of God. Why is it I can drive at 100 miles an hour down a turnpike and if I don't have the puck, they will take a picture of my car on a 360 scale, triangulate where I live, what my zip code is, my birth, my address, and they'll mail me a bill for that thing. But if I want to dump in at a boat ramp, I need $1.25 in exact change. I got to lick the stamp, put it in this little thing. That's dumb as hell. Electric kiosk is all you need. Just, just take what's already there and then you copy and paste it to like get into the damn boat ramp. You get your money. It's safe. You don't need somebody. Do that right there. You just made your money. You're stupid and this is dumb. Ran over. I just don't like hearing change. <laughs> The fight, over reopening Lake the fight over reopening Lake Manassas is nothing new. In, in 2011, Brookfield Homes took the city to court after a building 60 homes on the lake. No shock, okay. Which is located in Prince William County. The developer wanted its home buyers to have access to the lake, 
But the concerns of drinking, oh, bullshit, over drinking water over 9-11, which, by the way, if you live in Loudoun County, the richest county in the world, by the way, the richest county in the world, you're drinking water from the Potomac River. You're drinking piss water. So that makes no sense. But that's a very good leverage in an argument. A plan to bring George Mason University also presented a business plan on reopening the lake. Of course, a business plan to donate land for a new marina. Thus far, the city of Manassas has not been willing to exclusively carry the significant investment burden, the burden, the investment burden to open the lake. We'll just burn $100,000 a year, partially because the benefits will accrue to non-residents. The peasants, the people that do not live in the county, will see benefits from such a public charitable event as opening up a lake for enjoyment. How dare they, those heathens. We cannot afford to exclusively tax our residents for benefits for the peasants, I'm sorry, the people that do not live in our county. Obviously, the solution would be a private slash public partnership involving Manassas, of course. It must be private. Such a plan was developed a few years ago, but was not adequate. A charge for lake access. Ooh, ooh. Change, charge, charge. Manassas City Council, whatever her name is or her or it, made reopening the lake to the public a campaign issue last year. You know what? Good for you. I'm sorry I can't pronounce your name. <laughs> With several new council members in place, he says, oh, see, he says it may be time to bring up the issue again during council meetings. You can't stick your toe in the water or someone will arrest you. How dumb is that? Are we taking crazy pills? This guy is speaking kind of truth here. It's like, wait, you touch the water, you get arrested? It's kind of dumb. It's like, yeah, it is. While while the costs to reopen the lake, the lake are not known, Avina, I'm going to actually get my wife in here because I'm really getting upset that I'm quoting this person and he seems like an ally and I'm butchering his name. Carly. Could you help me with a name? Sure. I, I need to say this. I do not know how to pronounce this name. <laughs> it's kind of important to the article. Mark Avani. Okay, thank you. Avini. Avani. Avini. We're going to call him Mark. Marky Mark. His name is Mark now. Mark says they have to be less than what the city pays annually to keep people out. This is... If you're burning $100,000 a year to keep people out and you're saying that's more financially frugal, how much do you think it takes to keep a marina open? What is a marina to you? What is the definition in your eyes? I would love to debate these people. This would be fun as hell. Just to have this conversation of like, do you at least concede that it seems a little too much? According to the, and this will be good. I'll talk to these boys. According to the Virginia Department of Game and Fisheries, fishing alone is responsible for more than 1.3 billion in economic impact in the state. According to the Virginia Outdoor Report, citizens desire improved access to soft landings for kayaks and canoes. For the love of God, it's not just kayaks and canoes. I love kayaking. I please, I love you kayakers. I do, but you all went to Sleater's Lake, right? What is that thing? How the hell do you launch your kayak off that thing? The people that made that boat ramp were literally born in like the 1960s and said like, this is how people in 2023 launch stuff. Did you know that you can launch your kayak and canoe from a regular boat ramp? It's just, it's a concrete slab that goes into the water and you can launch stuff from there, anything from there, because then you can wheel it up and down. It's super easy versus this weird Lego float thing contraption that people have. So why does it have to just be kayak canoe? Just boat slip that that's it or, or or whatever you know you can reword it any way in the british language but anyway that would work great um access to the state waters for fishing swimming and beach use was was a top three need identified by the public who is the public where are these reports where are these these like little like like polls that we can take but they say the top three is like i want kayak and canoe access soft landings for kayak and canoe access f boats how much do people spend on boats each year? I know from like Mooney, Piney, and Hunting Run, there was going to be pullback that you couldn't actually launch a boat from there when they first started building these reservoirs. And then there was enough public outcry of like, wait a minute, my tax dollars pay for this place. And you're saying I can't launch my boat out of there? And then they had to rewrite it to where you could launch your big boat, but you had to use your trolling motor. That's insane that it feels like there's some kind of public mis- 
there's some miscommunication where it's like, we only want a kayak canoe boat slip and you're not allowed to have a boat or a boat is a, is a, um, a pull behind as a, the wake boat or something of like that. There are bass boats and fishing crafts. That's not a canoe. And it's not a wake boat. We use those all the time. Why can't we just have a regular boat ramp? Why are you afraid of having a boat ramp? That's just interesting to me. The Alliance wants to see the lake reopen to non-motorized boats and to fishermen. Non-motorized. What is motorized? Is electric motor a motor? Like it, It's just... Ugh. It just feels like a lot of these rules are written by people that aren't outdoorsmen. Shocking, right? Or people that don't know how to do finances. But yeah, that's the article, and I'll pin that. Um, I'll pin that article in chat because I just think that's insanely fascinating. Just, and it's not just like Manassas; it's everywhere. We live in Northern Virginia. We live in we live in Maryland, which is insanely developed. And the people that get on the boards of these things are not outdoorsmen. They don't understand what we're doing. It's, it's sometimes like the gun debate too, things like that, where it's like, what are you talking about? It makes no sense. It comes to conservation when people are talking about conserving things. And I saw this really with hunting for deer where they didn't want hunters around. And then they were shocked. Like we have a lot of deer and a lot of Lyme disease. We don't know why. And the hunter's like, yeah, I wonder why. But those are the people that are making our laws. And it's just, it's, it's insane. You can look at a golf course, but you can't play on it. Absolutely. Stephen Lloyd. I wish Loco would open up Goose Creek Res again. Unfortunately, a lot of these, it was an excuse. We all know this. It was an excuse to grab power. That's all it was. They use it as an excuse. For your safety, you're not allowed to have fun anymore. For your safety, we have to lock you in your house. So it that's all it was. And, and Goose Creek, you know, a fun fact, and I think I've said this on the show before, but with Goose Creek, it used to be the case where they were going to in, I think it was the 80s or 90s, they were going to turn Goose Creek into a massive reservoir. The reservoir would have been so big, it would have backed up to Middleburg. And because it was going to affect Middleburg, they shut that shit down real quick. Uh, that has got a lot of money in it, and they were not going to let that happen. But again, this gets into the point, and I'm going to do an episode specifically on lake building, because I think this is fascinating. where people don't want to build lakes but if there's a lake they can get their hands on they will build around that thing no problem and i thought it was interesting that the other two weekends ago i got to go up to lake holiday for the first time since i was like uh, like a wee lad i was you know, super young and i got to like see see the dam and fish from the dam something like that but it, anyway i i went up there and i got to explore with with some friends talk about the history of the lake and about how many houses were there and then I looked online to be like, well, how much are the homeowner fees to have a lake here? And I calculated the homeowner fees out. And I realized that with the homeowner dues, the homeowners association there collects between $700,000 and $1.5 million a year. That's how much they collect for a little lake that's 300 acres. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And if there's any dam issues or dam repairs, they pay on top of that. So you think that the homeowners association for Lake Holiday ballpark between 600,000 to $1.5 million a year, they pocket. That's a lot of money. And you think they're still building houses and they go up in value. If a lake, if you build a 10,000 acre lake and then you build two houses for every acre in each house in those two acres is $800,000. Those numbers start going up. And I think there is a lot of money to be made about building houses. And then the issue is like, well, is, can they recoup their investment? I think they can because it's getting to the point where there's value in waterfront property and the value is so great. And because they don't have it's supply and demand. There, there's not a lot of supply. And so the demand goes up. The value of those places go up. That's why like Anna prices just keep skyrocketing. So they're not like keep skyrocketing. So there is a case to be made in the future. If you build a two to 300 acre lake and you throw houses around it, you're going to recoup your investment eventually. Then you'd be like, well, the Chesapeake Bay Association, I, I get that. But I think that's the deal that's going to be struck is there's enough money there. As housing prices get more and more insane, the value gets more insane. I think they're leaving too much money on the table. And I think, again, it always comes down to money. And I think that's why lake 
ships will be built again, smaller ones, because you could make a deal with the state or the Chesapeake Bay Association. Like we're going to donate a million dollars a year to you, or you get a cut of the fund every year that we get from the homeowners fees to have this place. What I would like to see that happens though, is that Virginia or Maryland is like, okay, listen, we're going to give you some kind of blank bonus or something like that to build a lake. We'll let you build a lake or whatever. In return, though, whatever deal we strike, you have to put in a Department of Wildlife Resources park with a boat ramp. And then you can build around that lake for as much as you want. We don't care. Now, it still has to have regulations, all that stuff. But I think that's the deal that needs to be struck. It gives you the development that you want, the, the waterfront property and all that stuff. But the difference is it's the park is not owned. The park is not owned by the development. The park is owned by the state. It becomes a state park. Everyone wins. You get the you get the properties, you get the beachfront, blah, 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 lakefront stuff, and you get your ramp and you get to fish. Are we going to have another like 100,000 acre lake? I wish, but we're never going to have that, I think. But we could have a bunch of 100 to 400 acre lakes. Virginia could easily do that. And it makes financial sense, I think. And once I get the spreadsheet dialed in, I'll, I'll, I'll have a conversation about this. And I'd love to have a conversation about something else about lake building because I really do think like it's going to come back. There's going to be value in it, not just for water, but for just pleasure. And I think that'll happen, especially if people want to buy speedboats and you don't want to go to Deep Creek. I mean, think about it. Like if the prices get too absurd at Lake Anna, what if they shut down Lake Anna? That could happen. I mean, it's a long shot, but what if they just said like, hey, because of safety, there's too many people at Lake Anna. It's too dangerous. Some kid, some senator's kid got killed in a jet ski accident. So all of a sudden they'll be like, for your safety, all of Lake Anna is now private unless you're vacationing there and have a rental house or you have a little slip or like a little stamp. You can't launch a boat there. Sounds crazy, but what would stop people from doing that? They'll just, just like, you know, Stephen Lloyd said with 9-11, we're going to close down Goose Creek because of safety, your safety, you know, because the Senator's kid died in a jet skiing accident like Anna, because it was too crazy for your safety. We're gonna have to shut down the lake. So if you own a home, you're allowed to be there. No problem. If you're vacationing there, you're going to get a little slip that says you're there from here to here. No problem. But now this is closed and it's now, no, we're not trying to stop people. We're doing it to protect you from you. That could happen. Why, why couldn't it happen? Is it that crazy? Who knows? Let me know what you think in the comments. So thank you guys so much for listening. Uh, that ends the show and I'll see you guys next time on fishing the D M V Bye. You're listening to fishing the D M V with your hosts, Thomas Aaron's and Jared mounts fishing. The D M V is brought to you by Jake's bait and tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.